for being here. My name is Jason Delhorn. Um, I'm a faculty member in the GES Center. If you haven't seen me before. We have some new faces in the room. That's great. Um, I will send around this very fancy sign-up sheet. Um, you only need to put your name and email here uh, if you're not already on our list. Um, and you would like to receive announcements about our events, which include both colloquia and also other public talks and workshops and things that the GDS Center organizes. So I will pass this around. Um, we'll go around the outside room first, and then when it gets over there, you can head into the table and we'll go around the table. Have it go around the table. Uh, Todd, you wanted to make an announcement? Okay. Yeah, so, um, so shortly, the, the gist of it is come and talk to me after the closure maybe. You're interested in hearing more about this. So the International Union of Conservation of Nature um, is going to be running a large um, research project around synthetic biology focusing on gene drives and how it may impact conservation. Um, they asked us for some help with that, and one of the things they're asking for is potentially for a student or a graduate student to switch to a public-facing website which will be, in essence, a transparency type of website to talk about all the discussions that will be going on throughout that year or two year long process. Um, so if you're interested in working um, on this IUCN project, come talk to me. There's probably no salary associated with it, but there are expenses to the seven regions around the world where we're going to be having a consultation meeting, so it will at least give you an opportunity to travel potentially across the globe and interact with the colleagues and conservation as well as the community. Come talk to me after we talk more about it. Here. Thank you. Um, and the only other announcement uh, is that we've started a pilot uh, experiment. This is sort of a double. Uh, it's a little bit um, redundant. Um, it's a pilot discussion section that follows the colloquium. Um, we're going to have our first substantive one this Thursday. We meet in Gardner 2321. Um, and the model that the students and I uh, decided on last week was that we'll gather very quickly right after colloquium to choose a reading. Um, there's a Moodle site, and I'll post um, some ideas, and students can uh, suggest readings that we might do. We'll do one reading a week and talk about it in a Thursday noontime seminar. Students and faculty are both welcome. Um, so please see me right afterwards if you're interested in that. Any other GDS-related announcements? <laughs> All right, I will turn it over to Zach to introduce Mike. OK, so uh, thanks for coming today. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Mike Jones, who's a PhD student I've been working with couple of years. Um, so just a little bit of background about Mike. He uh, got his um, MS in Agricultural Economics from Purdue um, before uh, coming to NC State. Um, and he's, uh, as many of you know, he's a GDS uh, fellow and graduate student uh, as part of the center in the interdisciplinary uh, agriculture program. Uh, he's done an impressive amount of field work uh, all around the world. Uh, has more publications than I've ever had any other graduate student come, come to NC State with. Um, he has interests in agricultural economics, uh, entomology, and survey methods, uh, which makes him pretty much the perfect graduate student to carry out uh, to work with us on this uh, research that he's going to present on today. Um, this research, he'll mention this, but uh, this research was funded by a USDA plant exploratory research grant uh, one year um, program uh, to basically pay for the survey and collect the data. And so, and Mike's been uh, in the trenches you know, doing a lot of the actual data collection. Thanks, Zach. Uh, I am here today to talk to you about gene drives in agriculture, which is hopefully appropriate because I am actually part of the cohort uh, that GES brought in to discuss genetic modified insects in the context of agriculture. Uh, but now we're, we're sort of moving outside of our little chasm of, of what we think the public uh, might think and trying to bring this out uh, in the field. Uh, to present to the public uh, proposed applications of gene drives, uh, what they are, uh, what they might do, and sort of gauge public reactions, as well as looking at the information the public actually wants about gene drives and sort of the demand for uh, resolving some of the remaining uncertainties surrounding uh, gene drive applications in agriculture. Uh, this is collaborative work uh, done with uh, Zach Brown, that just introduced me, uh, Jason Delhorn, our guru, uh, Shark right now, and, and uh, as well as working with uh, Joanna here, uh, who is also in the GES cohort in entomology, who's been uh, instrumental throughout this entire process. Uh, we're also working with Paul Mitchell, uh, who's at uh, UW Madison, uh, and I'll talk a little about how that uh, collaboration came about. 
So when we talk about gene drives in agriculture, we are talking about engineered gene drives, which have really sort of rocketed it up to the top of the conversation with the facilitation of genetic engineering through CRISPR-Cas9, which is a gene editing technology which can make faster, uh, can make gene editing projects faster, uh, cheaper, and more efficient. And the specific context of gene drives means these uh, changes are able to be inherited uh, at what's known as super Mendelian inheritance. It is in, instead of only 50% of an uh, modified insects and a wild insect's offspring inheriting a trait, it's uh, at least theoretically much closer to 100%. I can't go into the entire mechanics here because I was told I have less time than I thought. Um, but these, this is a very powerful technology which does have the ability to spread genetic changes uh, fairly broadly, uh, at least specifically through a specific insect species. And uh, it gained enough uh, attention to have a National Academies report, which was commissioned a couple years ago. Uh, Jason was actually a part of that. Uh, an interesting thing is that the focus within that National Academies report was mostly on health and conservation applications. There was a grand total of zero discussion of agricultural insect pest applications uh, in the National Academies report. They did discuss uh, amaranthus uh, and uh, resistance management within that context. Um, they did not mention agricultural insects, but within the broader discussion of gene drives, they did talk about how there is a, a couple things. One, there is a promise and potential within this technology which does merit further research. They did not suggest going forward with field trials. Uh, at the time, field trials were a little tricky with something that's designed to spread far and wide uh, by design. Um, but they did recommend a thoughtful, careful engagement with stakeholders and publics. And uh, our research is kind of aligning with that uh, call. Um, and it's important to know why you want to engage with the public. Uh, this is a potential, <laughs> a, techno a powerful technology with potential permanent consequences in, in uh, an ecological context. And we want to make sure, you know, for example, that there's we don't regret anything uh, we made uh, in the in the ecosystem changes we make. And so respecting that. Um, uh, National Academy's authors have really called for a uh, precautionary approach. Now they said, I, I, I like the way this was phrased, I'm going to try to get this right, Jason's on that paper uh, so you can correct me, they said, we're not trying, we were trying to create flashing lights, off ramps, and, uh, and checkpoints rather than barriers to progression, which I think is, is, is refreshing and, and appropriate in a context of a technology that is this powerful. Uh, and major CRISPR developers, such as Kevin Esfeld, have actually come out and reversed uh, their opinions on uh, whether the gene drive use in certain contexts may be appropriate given the potential for uh, the genetic modifications to, to spread, um, which says something. And funders of the technology, uh, in a paper by Emerson et al. in Science, also came out and emphasized this sort of two-way public dialogue, how important transparency is, how important having confidence in the research process. And that goes so far beyond gene drives. I mean, this is just confidence in science, and that we want to make sure that uh, the public confidence in science is, is not compromised by this context as well. And they also keep pushing consideration of affected parties. Well, who's an affected party? Uh, that's a pretty broad net, right, in, in the context of something um, that's operating within a very diverse environment. Um, and the other thing that's important with gene drives in agriculture is that is it a commercial application, right? We have health, we have conservation, uh, but this is a commercial application to mitigate economic damage that's being done by certain insect pests and sectors with products that are that do have substitutes in the market that consumers are purchasing and the demand that consumers have for those products is and how, how gene drive insects may or may not affect the demand uh, for those products and how the demand uh, for those products may be affected in, in terms of alternative markets, for example, like or, organic uh, certification. Um, and so we have some questions that we want to address. First of all, we just want to know where, where does the public stand on this issue? And do, does that differ by diverse uh, applications of agricultural insect pests? Um, do preferences for existing genetic engineering in agriculture? Uh, does that shape any of the view, uh, public's view of gene drive insects? 
Um, how concerned is the public about eating foods uh, produced under these methods? And you know, do the research priorities in the scientific community, does that align with the public? Are we answering the questions the public wants to know? Or are we coming up with this broad set of like, really fantastic data that's not necessarily going to resonate um, with uh, uncertainties, or if you may want to call it fears, that the public may have uh, about the technology? So first, I want to start with uh, some focus groups we did. Uh, we started this project in 2016, actually, at the Roadmap for Gene Drives uh, conference, uh, which was done here at NC State, put in a USD proposal, and one of the first things we did was exploratory uh, focus groups. We did three of them, uh, one in Durham, uh, recruiting at a food lion uh, just south of NC Central. Uh, the other was recruiting at the farmer's market here in Raleigh, close, uh, imagine diverse uh, audiences in, uh, between the two, and then uh, in a small town called Dunn at the corner basically of 95 and 40, um, trying to get diverse perspectives on, on the issues. And we got some great insights. Um, Joanna actually was uh, really instrumental uh, in helping uh, facilitate and design this focus group. She was our, our scientific expert, as sort of the moderator for the focus group. I didn't want to present all this information and look like I'm, I'm pitching it, for example, and then ask them what they think. You know, and so it sort of allowed a, a, a um, uh, a more facilitated, uh, easier flow of conversation between the participants uh, and myself. And so we got a couple different insights. One is that they're difficult but possible to explain to a broad audience. We needed to spend legitimate time discussing what this is. You can't just walk out and say, genetically modified insects, stuff can spread. Do you like it or not? I mean, it's just like, that doesn't work, right? Um, and a lot of public opinion work is just very short snippets, right? And, and that just simply wasn't going to work in this context. So we had to expand a little further. And we also had to talk about why gene drives were being employed, um, that this wasn't just sort of uh, the first option, like we have a hammer, everything's a nail. I mean, these were sort of sticky problems, entomological problems that are, uh, we've sort of exhausted uh, quite a large array of options to, to deal with them. Uh, and there are also uh, pesticide trade-offs. When people really heard, bef before and after people knew that we have increased pesticide use because of these insects and the removal of the pest problem, be it a crop disease or uh, the physical presence of the insect that's sort of damaging the, the crops, uh, that we could actually reduce the levels of pesticide. That, that did affect how people thought about it, and that was important to bring into the conversation, not just sort of economic damages. Um, and the other thing was that um, implications for human health were sort of always on people's minds. I mean, this really like, consistently came up. What if I eat one of these things? What's gonna happen? And so like, we realized that sort of clear messaging there was, was pretty important. Um, and so we were gonna bring that more into the survey to try to gauge that with a, a broader audience. Um, and the other thing was that the type of insect modified matters. Um, the bottom right here, this gene drive inheritance, was the original way we presented, or Joanna presented, how gene drives sort of work with that preferential inheritance. That is a mosquito picture. We learned that people think about mosquitoes differently than they think about other insects being modified. Mosquitoes have a relationship with our blood, like literally the most like, is the blood of the civilization. I mean, the blood is so symbolic. And yes, okay, it's only the female insects that are uh, that are biting people. A lot of people know that, first of all. They had a heck of a campaign trying to teach people that in, in South Florida. Um, but also, just the species in general having a, a biting relationship uh, versus sort of a present relationship out in the fields. I mean, so many people are removed from agricultural production sort of out there. It seemed a little more distant, although it's still on their food, and that was still important. So we needed to cut mosquitoes from the entire conversation of agriculture, because then we were going to have to reorient people afterwards. We needed more neutral imagery uh, in terms of what the pictures look like. Um, and then is the insect supposed to be there? Right? The, just the idea that it was an invasive, non-native species in an area uh, that had arrived fairly recently. We discussed the examples uh, of uh, spiderwing drosophila, which is a, a berry pest, uh, which is from East Asia. It's causing pretty widespread damage in uh, in cherries, blueberries, strawberries, raspberries, blackberries, quite a few of the berries, um, and uh, also in the Asian citrus psyllid, which spreads uh, vectors of bacteria and causes citrus green, a massive problem in, um, in citrus production in the United States, but that, that's also from East Asia, and these are, you know, decade-old arrivals, something like that. 
right? Um, and so that sort of mattered how people thought about the consequences. So we brought that into the um, survey, and we ran a survey through uh, GFK's knowledge panel. I will say we first pre-tested this through MTurk, and we also got massive survey design feedback from every most people uh, that are heavily affiliated with GES. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, that was so helpful figuring out how to disseminate that scientific information to a broader audience. Um, but when we when we fielded the sample uh, finally through GFK, they maintained something called the knowledge panel, uh, which is uh, a, a really uh, great sample. They use address-based recruiting. Uh, they are a probability sample. Um, and so there, there's a lot of web panels that exist. It's a website. You, you want to join. You click. You join up. You give your demographic profile, and you sort of get fielded. This, they have to come to you. And they also bring you a laptop if you're regularly taking their surveys. So you can access uh, a much broader audience uh, that is actually representative, uh, or much closer to be representative, of course, uh, of the US adult population, uh, especially with these lower socioeconomic status, um, people who may or may not you know, be able to be normally accessed through web-based surveys. Um, we got over 1,000 completes. And uh, it was a long survey. It was uh, 23 minutes. Um, There's about five to six minutes of startup time uh, discussing the information panel, as well as uh, frequently asked questions, which was a voluntary supplementary information that a lot of people actually access. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but um, with our final sample of 1,000, sorry to put up big tables. I hate big tables and presentations. But this is just to show that our, our actual sample matched really nicely what the uh, census weighting uh, brought us up to. Uh, what GFK also does is uh, provide survey weights uh, along, uh, along many, many different panels, um, it, as far as age, education, income, race, ethnicity, even going as far as to geographic uh, location. And so what we can do is when we, when we discuss our estimates, these are statistically representative of uh, observable characteristics of the US adult population. So the survey flowed uh, through some introductory uh, questions about consumption, uh, the types of foods people are consuming, uh, whether they're consuming, for example, organic products, non-GMO or GMO-free type labeled products. Uh, we asked them about blueberries and or orange juice, for example, to work with later. Uh, we had information panels, voluntary, uh, frequently asked questions that we did. I will say, within the frequently asked questions, if they did not select it, they got randomly selected at a probability of one third to see uh, any of the specific questions, and that's for, to sort of control for information effects and things like that later. Um, and there was an uncertainty ranking exercise where people saw uh, an iterative subsets of questions, uh, uncertainties that remain in terms of gene drive use uh, and ecological effects versus technological uh, or technical feasibility, cost effectiveness, things of that nature, which we'll discuss in a minute. Uh, and so we got a, a, a ranking of those. Uh, we discussed organic certification in context of gene drive insects. Had a whole willingness to pay exercise, which as an economics student breaks my heart. I don't have room whatsoever uh, or the data analyzed to be able to discuss actual you know, demand implications of this. Uh, sorry to the economics professor in the room. Um, professors. Um, but the, some of the crux of the stuff we're going to be discussing is actually uh, some uh, lighter questions uh, along diverse applications of gene drives. And the, the reason I, this flow is important is that these questions happened after all of this was discussed. They have really, really chewed on this material. They discussed all the uncertainties. We've been very transparent about things that are known and unknown. And, and then those results reflect sort of that cumulative process. Uh, and then we discussed a little bit of awareness uh, and uh, trust in institutions uh, to do gene drive research. Okay, so communicating this was uh, tricky, but what we talked about people with first was talking about consequentiality. Your thoughts matter. And this was really fascinating in the pretest because you know we had a lot of material that we were discussing, but once we introduced the concept of consequentiality, we realized it was just really best practices that your answers to questions about the following information will inform policy decisions at the USDA, which is true. We're delivering, we have deliverables to the USDA to inform policy. Um, the time spent on the reading the material, because we've, we've timed out every single panel that people went through, uh, that increased quite a bit. We didn't experimentally control for it. That would have been really interesting. Uh, but we found that people really spent more time with the material once they knew that their thoughts, 
and that we're actually going into something. It wasn't just going into some black hole. Um, but we discussed that you know you can use CRISPR-Cas9 uh, to modify insect genes for two things. We discussed replacement drives, which we talked about in, in the context of altering insects to prevent G trans disease transfer, and suppression drives, which are meant to reduce insect populations. Uh, we did not use the phrase replacement and suppression. Those are a little jargony, right? And so we, we sort of brought in that rewording. Uh, we talked about how uh, drive spreads gene changes, how the release of a small number of insects can spread over time to uh, potentially the entire uh, the species population. And we discussed proposed applications in spotted wing to, quote, reduce or locally eliminate populations. And, uh, and we also discussed uh, citrusilla to, quote, no longer pass uh, a, a greening bacterium. We discussed a couple of things. One was that these insects are an economically important problem. I mean, this, this is causing billions of dollars in damage in both industries. Uh, that um, We discussed that pesticide use has increased dramatically as a result of these insects, which is, is all true. We've consulted with people across the country. Um, and we discussed um, that gene drive, uh, that these are proposed gene drive applications. Uh, and for example, we gave some imagery to discuss uh, a paper actually by Matt Scott, um, who I really wish was here. Um, and uh, they were proposing to, and they did some lab work, uh, modifying the insect uh, spotted wing Drosophila females to not have a sharp egg laying device which could pierce berries, rather it would be dull and couldn't. We didn't use the word ovipositor, sorry entomologists in the room, that doesn't really resonate right with the broader population. Uh, but we sharp body part was as close as I, I could get. Um, or Marty, okay, I'm gonna move a little faster. Um, and so afterwards we looked at frequently asked questions. People could voluntarily access this information, right? 89% selected at least one question. That's that's actually shocking, right? You've just read a uh, like, pretty substantial amount of material as far as a lot of surveys these people are reading uh, go. And 89% uh, selected at least one. Our most popular questions were what are some of the possible risks of gene drive, uh, gene drives? And Within those, uh, within that question, we discussed uh, focusing on nascent uh, verbiage that discussed ecological consequences. That we there are a lot of ecosystems we simply don't understand very well, and there may be some ecological consequences of removing uh, a species from that environment. Um, people also want to know about immediacy. Has anyone created a gene drive? I'll sort of let you visually run through the rest of this list. Um, but we also, one thing I do want to say too, is we address head on this whole GMO terminology. Do you call it genetically engineered? Do you call it genetic modified? One thing that's interesting is in the abstract of the NASA report, they use the phrase genetically modified a lot. And after the executive summary, I mean the executive summary, after the executive summary, they use the phrase genetically engineered a lot. Right? But in the part that really went out to the public, that the public was really going to focus on, they focused on the terminology that's most familiar. And so we wanted to stay true to that. So we actually said, is a drive, gene drive insect a GMO? And the answer is, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, but it's sort of one step further that, in, that these genetic modifications are sort of meant to spread to, to some extent. You know, it's a microphone. Um, great. And so when we did the Likert questions, looking at support and opposition, we focused on um, three different cases, which blew up into the effect design of, of eight questions at reducing suppression versus altering uh, replacement. We looked at native versus non-native, and we did actually point out that uh, just that both examples we provided on spider wing and citrus psyllid uh, were non-native in invasive species uh, to the United States. And we talked about unlimited versus limited drives. The wording we used are, are whether controls are present for how far a gene drive can spread. We did not go into the detail of how a daisy chain works. I mean, it's just, you just can't do it, right? But we did introduce the concept that scientists have proposed trying to limit how far a gene drive can spread, and we sort of varied that across. Uh, and this is on a five-point Likert scale from strongly opposed to strongly support with a don't know option. Uh, for the purpose of visualization, and the results are robust to this, we combine this and strongly opposed and opposed into one opposed category, strongly support support into one support category, and then neither is a don't know into a, a middle category. Yeah. Uh, what do we get? Great. So this was pretty interesting. On the left, you have replacement drives. On the right, we have suppression. Then we have the pairwise uh, uh, 
sets of, of controls, no controls, native, non-native. Now the first one, if I catch your eye, is this uh, application in which, for example, the wording is uh, altering populations of non-native species to cure crop, not carry crop disease with controls to limit how far the gene drive spreads. We have between 57 and 60% support for uses uh, in this context, right? And that holds for both replacement and suppression. Once we move, especially outside of uh, context of where there are controls for how far the gene, the gene can spread, uh, that support erodes oh, pretty quickly. Um, we actually, for the other context of uh, no controls for spread, but in a non-native species, sort of this unlimited drive context, um, we had, we did have just barely, I mean, tenth of a percent more support than opposition, um, but uh, nowhere near the the level of support we had um, for for the first application. Um, and so, this uh, may have real consequences for how people might want to consider uh, designing drives and, and how they might uh, be received by the public. Getting a little more into it, um, are all drives the same? So uh, when we actually sort of tease this out and, and stack the respondent questions and look at it through an order logic model uh, through sort of this natural ranking of, of likelihood responses, um, we have about a 22% reduction uh, in some percentage point reduction uh, with no controls, about 11% reduction with uh, native versus non-native, and uh, measurable but small, 1.5% uh, significant reduction for suppression versus replacement. Uh, and in terms of who's more likely to support drive use, um, in terms of consumer characteristics, uh, we have some things that make sense. Uh, people that are regularly buying products that are non-GMO or GMO-free labeled, they're about 7% less likely to support the use of Gene drives. Um, some of these benefits really accrue to consumers of very specific products, right? If you don't consume blueberries, if you don't consume orange juice, you really might not get much out of this, but then you still have to sort of bear any potential risk of these gene drive insects being in the environment. Um, so we sort of naturally uh, think that consumers that are of, of these products uh, might be more supportive. Um, and we get about a 4% uh, percentage point increase in, in support uh, if the household uh, buys orange juice. Among demographic characteristics, there's not a lot going on, to be honest. Um, religiosity, how much religion influences uh, people's daily lives, um, the level of education, income, race, uh, age. Uh, we have a, a little bit going on with uh, gender, of, Women are about four percentage points less likely to support drive use than men. Uh, I will say that sort of this big macro model hides a little bit of nuance, which is interesting when you break this out into support for the very specific applications. And one thing that's notable is that uh, for um, predictors of support for applications where there is no controls for the spread, uh, people with a graduate degree and a bachelor's degree are actually much less likely to support that application. And when there are controls in place for the spread, they're actually much more likely to support uh, these applications. And so that might have something to do with the uh, increased understanding of sort of these ecological functions and whatnot. Uh, so what about USD organic certification? Um, this, is, this is a little interesting, right? Because uh, it's a, it's a not extremely clear policy-wise what would happen under the USDA standard, right? I mean, this is like this, there's kind. Of, I mean, you work with organics quite a bit, right? Um, you know, this isn't like a, a very clear-cut answer. It has to do with intentionality and things like that. Um, but the perceived integrity of that organic certification might also be very important to organic consumers uh, if something um, should be able to be labeled organic. And so we presented two scenarios in which a farmer was following all current USDA organic standards, but the use of gene drives, uh, gene drive insects in the area, were, quote, used in the area to control a damaging insect species, right? So there's a little bit of distance, but it's clearly there's some proximity. And then we pushed a little further, right? Because 
It doesn't matter as much if it's sort of flying in the air, and you might sort of maybe imagine it's interacting, but we need to know what people think when it, the insects are actually interacting with these products. So we pushed it. It said, what if the use of gene-derived insects results in some genetically modified insect eggs, immature larvae, or adults getting on or in the crops? That's pretty hard pushing, right? But that is certainly imagery that will exist. Uh, it's imagery that will be communicated by certain bodies, uh, and so it's important to know how people are going to react to that. Um, and we asked if they agreed or disagreed that the farmer should be able to be uh, certified organic. Um, and we did see differences in the context that were presented. I will note one thing that's important is that there is not majority agreement that the farmer should be able to retain organic certification under either of these words, right? Now, when it's in the area, um, most of the people that responded did, or 44% of the people that responded did say they agreed, and that was significantly higher than uh, when in the context of when you really have to imagine uh, these insects interacting with this product. Um, uh, but in terms of people who disagree, that's probably where the attention needs to be focused, is, is the folks who disagree that these folks should be, that these farmers should be able to retain certification. Yes, sir. Is, is this reflective of the fact that most consumers actually don't even know what organic really means? I'm going to address that in the next slide. Thank and the answer is yes, a little bit. <laughs> um, and so, um, but we do see, um, most people that are responding do say they, they disagree. And these are among, and this, this is important to say, sorry, it's at the beginning, is this is among people who have affirmed that they regularly purchase USDA organic products. We, do, we did ask everyone this question, but this is the relevant uh, population, uh, certainly policy-wise. I'm happy to share the results from, from the global group. So what if people don't know <laughs> what our uh, USDA organic standard actually says? And what about specifically if they don't know about the trade-offs of, of what they're getting, right? Uh, we asked people, to what extent do you believe the following statement is true? Food produced under uh, USDA organic certification allows the use of certain types of insecticides, right? Now, certain types. The answer to that question, that is true. Um, and what was interesting, it, well, okay, before I even show that, sorry to steal away, is that there is some substitution in terms of gene drive insects versus increased pesticide requirements now, uh, or pesticide use. Now, organic farmers have much less of, um, they have a much smaller suite of products they're allowed to use. Uh, it's much more difficult, but there is sort of uh, an understanding that there, there is higher uh, insecticide use. The differences, the significantly, the statistically significant differences did occur uh, here with almost a majority of people agreeing when they were aware uh, that insecticides uh, are allowed to some extent in a very narrow range in the organic standard. Um, very interesting is that 57% of people got that right who bought organics. The number of people who got it right that did not buy organic was 51%, which is a coin flip. And those differences are not statistically significant. Um, so there's not tremendous sort of awareness here. Um, so what we really see a, a big difference in, uh, that I would say the, is the most notable, is here on the, when gene-drive gene insects are in or on the crops uh, among the people who disagree uh, with that question. Um, it's, it's very high. These people are, are uh, this subset is really driving really the overall uh, result. Uh, so I, and what I will say is we also ask people, we realize values are important and things, reasons people that are buying organic are important. And so we ask people uh, if they're buying organic to specifically avoid GMOs, and that, okay. and that uh, was also an important driver in a smaller subset. And I'm happy to discuss that later. Can you take a couple extra minutes? Thank you. Um, what do we still need to know? What can the public tell us to inform the research process going forward as we're deciding where we need to allocate time and resources to answer these uncertainties? This this is a a, a decent list from the uh, focus group discussion in, in Raleigh, in the things they said they wanted um, answered. We described the uh, things that Na the National Academy brought up uh, in terms of uh, technical feasibility, the, like the finer components of that. We also discussed uh, in terms of, for example, horizontal gene transfer. You know, can these constructs accidentally, you know, move between species, for example? Um, but some of the notable ones that they brought up after that discussion. 
uh, was you know, how do we measure the spread of the drive? Are there controls so the technology is developed for any species? What controls how far the flies can spread? The, the word control is, is resonating throughout this entire process in each of these you know, methods of data collection. Uh, they also want to know about the private sector. People were a little, a little sketchy about the private sector, so we ended up sort of including uh, some uh, questions uh, later. And so to get at this, we had 10 options, 10 items, uh, some of which we needed to condense within the wording. For example, uh, when you're asking about um, the efficiency of, or um, the fitness of insects that are uh, genetically <coughs> modified. Uh, versus the resistance management, we sort of combine that into like, will the drive actually work? Will the insects actually mate with, will drive insects actually mate with wild insects and will the construct continue to be passed along? Um, others we, we sort of um, uh, needed to, to reword a little bit. For example, you can't say horizontal dream transfer, you need to say something more like can they pass between species? Uh, but we included extra questions as well that came out of the focus groups such as uh, things like cost effectiveness, things like will it change the taste or appearance of food? People are really interested in who's going to regulate this thing. Um, and so we use something called best worst scaling, which is a method to statistically rank options. You can't just throw 10 things at people and tell them to list it 1 through 10. It goes really, really poorly in the literature. Uh, but what you can do, which works a lot better, is people are uh, pretty good at working with smaller subsets of data and picking out extreme extrema, right? And so we showed iterative subsets of four questions. We asked them to pick the most important and the least important question. And you can take a not super beefy, but decently beefy model uh, that's a complex model, that a hybrid model that can incorporate both uh, the information we get from what's selected most important and what's selected least important into a, a multinomial logic model um, that can help us statistically rank these. Now, another thing you can do, which is super easy, is you just count up how many times each question appeared and what percent of the time was it selected most important. And so the next uh, image actually combines those two. Um, so human health effects and environmental consequences of pest removal were a statistical tie for the most important things. This shouldn't really surprise us that much. Um, but it does reinforce um, that uh, human health effects are, are, there needs to be some sort of clear messaging on this. This is really going to resonate with people, especially if perhaps if, if that's the, the threat, some threat to human health is brought up um, uh, by any party. Um, we had, I was, I was really proud of people for ranking the secondary pest potential pretty high. If you remove a pest, will another species just simply take that place and cause similar crop damage? You really want, probably want to know that, right? Um, and, and people uh, picked up on that. Um, what I will say, uh, since I'm running out of time, is that um, there's, a, there's a lot of discussion of reversal drives and sort of that being a safety net. If something goes wrong, we can design a, a gene drive, push that through to sort of delete whatever changes we made or sort of bring us back closer to how things were uh, before. And we ask people, um, I, I want to read it, make sure I get it right. We ask people, um, Days. Could genetic changes caused by a gene drive be reversed? That's how we worded it, right? And that question was ranked very low, right? And when you combine that with the data from uh, prioritization of environmental consequences, when you combine that with the real importance of controlling how far a gene drive can spread, what I'm at least inferring from this, and what our team has sort of inferred from this, and we can definitely discuss this, is that people may really want a lot more certainty about what genetic changes are going to be made and where, rather than sort of relying on some sort of ex post solution. Um, that's really what I, I'm getting out of this. And lastly, uh, for the researchers in the room, we ask people how much do you trust the following institutions to do G drive research on AGPES? Uh, US universities, USDA, uh, rank pretty high. Um, there was less than 10% people that found US universities untrustworthy to do this research. And again, this is at the very end, understanding the stickiness, the difficulty of, of this research. Um, private corporations, not so much. I imagine this is probably trans true from everything from shampoos to food to whatever else. This is not an uncommon finding, finding that people don't trust the private industry. Uh, but it does align kind of well with uh, the recent decisions for CRISPR licensing 
where they decided when they licensed it to Monsanto and other large agribusiness firms that they took gene drive applications completely off the table uh, for them to do that. It aligns well with sort of what the public is saying about uh, who they trust working with this. What do we do with this information? Uh, there is this cautious, um, cautious majority support for specific applications. Uh, but the ecological risk assessments that NASM is, is recommending, it does seem to align pretty well uh, with the types of questions the public places the highest uh, importance on for answer. So human health concern does remain. Now, in the NASM report, human health um, investigations were discussed in the context of gene drives for human disease vectors. But maybe if they had brought up agricultural insects at all, they would have discussed that as well. Um, but this question is probably going to come up in whatever gene drive applications uh, really are, are jumped up. Um, this organic data, I think we should take this seriously. I, I think we should really sort of wrestle and maybe talk out now about uh, how alternative market effects may impact overall policy decisions to release these insects that absolutely will not expect respect field level differences. We have groups in California right now, actually, um, the uh, Cherry Board, I believe, uh, which is funding research at UC River Drive to design drive spotted wing. Organic growers are among that. Does grower association support challenge the potential for retaining USDA certification if genetically modified insect material is, is sort of found uh, in on these uh, crops? And even more importantly, is the perception of what organic means? And is that challenged as well? Um, and there's of course cost benefit, uh, but you know there's a real question of values here. Why people, are, what organic farming is about? There's something beyond, you know, the canonical ec uh, economic understanding of this that I think we should also wrestle with seriously. And you know, working out in the end, you know, do the cost savings to organic producers from releasing something like a gene drive insect that could really reduce a lot of pest pressure that they specifically are having a hard time dealing with. Does that outweigh any potential negative market consequences? Um, we're going to try to wrestle with that in the willingness to pay studies, um, but that's something to really sort of pay attention uh, moving forward uh, within that, that space. It does appear to be room for education. Uh, we have receptive audiences. They're accessing this information after they've already been kind of given quite a bit of information in the first place, right? Uh, and there's also room, for example, in the organic sphere of understanding what organic means, just like this gentleman pointed out. Um, and sort of understanding that there is potentially a, a risk trade-off there. Uh, and that the public still states high trust uh, for U.S. universities uh, to conduct this gene drive research. Uh, we have a lot of further work to be done. This willingness to pay analysis, linking the best worst, scaling the ranking of uncertainties with the willingness to pay, um, and uh, follow-up focus group data collection to really like prod things that we're getting out of this. And this discussion will help us decide what maybe we should focus on there, and continuing to engage in public, which publics, we like to say that a lot in GDS, uh, broad public, there's very specific publics, but there's certainly, I think, messages to be pulled out of this study, this research, to inform that. And thank you, everyone. Thanks to the... We have about uh, 15 minutes for questions. Jen. Yeah, so I, that's a good point. Um, and we discussed in the setup um, for the question, I'm going to We discussed in the setup for that question um, that scientists have proposed sorry, that scientists have proposed trying to control um, so finally some scientists have proposed trying to control how far a gene drive can spread uh, we'd like to know how you feel when 
about gene drives when scientists try to limit how far a gene drive can spread versus gene drives which are allowed to potentially spread uh, to the population of that insect species, the global population of that insect species, unfortunately. Um, and so we introduced more of the nuance in the beginning. Um, there, it did just say controls, uh, with, with controls and without controls to limit. There's a chance. I mean, there is a chance. Um, and so maybe this is a, a lower bound, for example, for what the public support would be uh, for the applications. Um, I think we tried to be fair to the nuance, at least you know, in the, in the lead up to that question. I don't have that number off the top of my head. I can get that for you. Do you guys have an idea? 3%. Specifically within berries. In, in orange juice, it's all organic. So, for example, within orange juice, it's, it's much lower than it is for berries. Um, so, our specific applications we presented do differ quite a bit. Um, but, yeah, thank you. So in your ranking of trust, uh, military came out above private industry, and as someone who's getting military money right now, it's uh, a little bit interesting. Do you care to pontificate on that? No. Okay. <laughs> no. Uh, so I'll tell you one thing first that I wish we did, which is you know you get to the end, you always wish you did. So is it would have been nice if we had a follow-up question about U.S. university studies with different uh, funding sources. Um, that would have been nice, um, which we might have been able to directly answer that. Uh, we did not. Uh, but I, I think the difference, first of all, between the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Defense, maybe, you know, there's this whole Area 51-y sort of thing going on, but also, like, we did say gene drive research on agricultural tests, so people might have just assumed this is the relevant government institution to be doing this type of work. And the fact that all this money is coming from DARPA rather than the USDA is its own topic of conversation, obviously. But um, there's, uh, but in terms of private industry, I mean, we're close to the small private company. I would bet you wouldn't get much statistical difference there. I can certainly look that up for you if you'd like. Um, but yeah, I just add that uh, as a, also someone from a nonprofit, that's of interest because I know that there are more yeah, nonprofits involved now. I think. And, uh, Sorry, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. When when you're doing your follow up and you're talking about costs, are you are you really balancing that not just against uh, the decrease in maybe insecticide use, but also the carbon footprint benefits that you get from every time you're spraying, you're running a tractor, all these. I mean, are you really making sure that people are aware what the Increase potentially increase sustainability index kind of thing is? Yeah, so within these types of willingness to pay studies, there's always a suite of, there's an infinite you know, suite of characteristics involved, and you really have to hone in on subsets. And so that full analysis is not part of the whole, the carbon footprint is actually not part of this at, at all. Uh, it, we, we measure on um, a couple different things. One is uh, the level of insecticide spraying, whether it's high conventional spraying, low conventional spraying, that is defined within frequency, uh, or, or only USD organic um, insect control. Uh, we also look at whether the plant is genetically modified. One thing we want to know is, is do people think about uh, genetically modified crops differently for the same species than they do having genetic modified insects in and around that crop. Um, and then there's, so there's genetic modification of the crop, and then there's also gene drive insects present in the area. And we did say in the area. Um, and one thing we can pull out of that, for example, is sort of the interaction between uh, premiums for organic, for example, with and without presence of gene drive insects in the area, and sort of see if those, that the answers regarding <coughs> certification, credibility, or integrity translate into choices actually made uh, later. So that, those are the things we need. You have price parameters as well to bring in an actual dollar sign. Um, if you need to, 
Uh, I want to thank you. Really rich, nuanced stuff. Um, I could see three more presentations are in here. That's great. Um, and I really like the way you brought in kind of the, the human health and how there's this kind of discursive world out there that you can't ignore because it's always impinging on what people think about gene drives. And I'm wondering, you know, maybe uh, food for thought for the follow-up focus groups is these words needed and non-needed in today's immigration climate. So when people are nativist, when nativism goes up, do for insects. Yeah, there you go. Now, things definitely permeate across yeah. conversations, and I, I agree with that would be interesting to look at. We wrestled with that, because is it invasive or non-invasive? Yeah. Is it like, you know, because you've got these general, borders yeah. drawn around the United States, and that sort of gives us some artificial thing that I don't care about, you know? And so, anyways, we, we did have to settle on that. Um, but I think, in the end, that was our best option, yeah. given the language we had available. Um, and one thing with the focus groups that I will say is, you know, we have the audio data uh, still for all of the uh, three focus groups. If people are particularly trained and interested in focus group methodology uh, and want to talk to us about, you know, working with that, we can definitely uh, be open uh, to that as well. Um, yeah. So since you mentioned that parallel part when uh, the trust in large private companies may align with how patents are now grant, granted. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, gene drive system was, was one of the conditions when broad system granted the, the, the patent to Monsanto, but they also claimed that they were not, they, they will not be uh, able to, to create terminator seeds, mythical terminator seeds. What I was wondering is, what do you think about, what are the benefits and the downside of of the scientists having public opinion into account when they are developing how the patents are going to Yeah, um, what is the benefit of this? You, when you say that scientists, you're, you're discussing particularly in, in terms of licensing agreement or in terms of broader policy? No, no, licenses. I, I mean, how the public views uh, institutions and how the public views corporations has become even more important as voices have been able to be amplified about what those opinions are in the media uh, and in social media and things like that. I think the institutions are gauging much more what the public thinks about decisions and trying to anticipate public reaction before they're making decisions, perhaps more now than in the past, but that's, that's speculating. There might be people in the room that can speak better to that. Um, but uh, I, I certainly hope they are taking these into consideration as sort of brand value, brand perception is pretty important, uh, as well as specifically, you know, when it's a public institution, I think there is some real duty to not go fully against what the public <laughs> is, uh, is, is perceiving or how the public's aligning on an issue. Um, that's, that's pushing outside of, of my expertise, but maybe delving into more of my personal views. I would say one thing might be interesting to get at, and so, I mean, the patents that are out there now for this are all on CRISPR, they're not on gene drives, yes. but what like, Esbell and Harvard are trying to do with they want the patent on gene drive is to then put that gene drive patent into, in essence, a nonprofit organization gets to decide who and who doesn't is able to use that, get that license based on what they're going to use it for and also their, the way they're actually going to implement it, which is a very different way or mm -hmm. idea of how to actually grant licenses. It's going to be very tricky. Um, it's going to be interesting to see if the patent office even agrees to something along those lines. So That's never There's exactly. some really interesting additional Potentially, a figure like this might be useful. <laughs> you know. I mean, the interesting to me, that most, one of the most interesting things is that there was pretty much no difference between whether you were going to do acceptance of a gene drive to in essence kill the insect versus to modify it to sort of transfer a, um, a disease or yeah. 
You know, and this this right here is is a main effect, but when you actually look at um, the importance of, of replacement versus suppression, uh, taking interaction terms with these other attributes, uh, the real driver of that significant reduction uh, in support or suppression is in when there are no controls for spread. That that is the real driver. Uh, and again, space. Yeah, yeah. Happy to discuss that uh, afterwards, um, but it actually up here, suppression is not statistically significant, but it's about sixty percent versus fifty-seven percent. So there's actually higher, you know, point estimate support um, for suppression drives there. Yes. I think about um, a lot of the, the respondents who were purchased non-GMO products. If uh, if you've done this with those. Or is there any secondly, is there any different among that group when you add the control language? Because if they're like, if they're never ever, or never ever, it doesn't matter. Yeah. But that can kind of, you know, you know bias a little bit. Um, just subtracting those out would be. So, would be yeah. Like, yeah, so we did do that. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, so, the, so we, have a, we have a draft going on these results. Uh, LSPs were trying to find a home for recommendations, uh, <laughs> uh, recommended uh, or requested. But uh, we do look at the breakout with all those demographic drivers for each sort of you know model building along the way uh, to be transparent about you know, how things move and whatnot. And, and whether or not you avoid uh, GMOs is important in many but not all applications. Uh, <clears throat> and so they are they aren't never ever, but they are. Much more never ever. They are much more never in, in certain contexts than others. And I'm, I'm happy to, I actually have the full results with me. I can talk to you about it afterwards. Um, this is cool. Right. I just thought it was interesting that we were talking about the mosquitoes and how they're biting, you know, has, has an impact. And I was just thinking of this, you know, a lot of this is very far away from any personal experience for most of the people who you're talking to. But if you ask them these same questions about getting rid of cockroaches and rats, in the city context, you know, I just wonder how that would impact uh, the right of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, there's there's a lot of room for comparing context, and yeah. hopefully, you know, um, follow up research could hopefully be done to sort of keep that time dimension from confounding things in case anything crazy happens, you know, before one survey round and another. Um, but it'd be great to compare this to. Mosquitoes, for example, uh, it would be great to compare this to home pests or more tangible urban pests. Um, I think another thing that uh, we're pushing around a little bit, um, Joanna, sorry for saying this out loud, but I'm talking to you about it first, but um, you know, Joanna's doing some really cool work uh, discussing with experts about research priorities and things they're most worried about, and I'm not paraphrasing that correctly, sorry, Joanna. Um, but one thing we would love to do is compare the way experts rank these uncertainties with the exact same format and sort of see how that may differ from the public to see if we're, you know, moving on the, things align, things are moving on the right path, uh, respecting the public's beliefs, or if, if we really need to sort of radically rethink what's going to end up resonating with the public. Um, so there's a lot of fair comparison that can be done, and if you're interested in making those comparisons, Please talk to us. Great. So let's give Mike a hand. So I think that, you know, we have a nice crowd here today. Some people may never have come before. This is an amazing example um, of the kind of interdisciplinary research that GES has, has fostered. Um, and Mike, you're, you've been here since your fourth year? A long time. Which is not the first presentation, not that long. But um, you can see how, how this project which you know could have been very narrowly construed as just simply looking at willingness to pay for gene drive, um, was informed by a completely different methodology that was not familiar to Mike, which was focus groups, which led to a much broader set of questions and a richer set of data. Um, and that's exactly the kind of work that we're trying to foster here in GDS. So I'm really proud of Mike um, and proud of our group for helping uh, to make this possible. Because clearly a lot of people were involved in giving feedback um, and helping Mike design this survey and think through the results. And we certainly welcome 
very, you know, anyone's participation in helping us think through how to publicize and um, put this information out there. Um, and then I just want to announce that next week's, uh, I, I don't have it in front of me, but uh, Magda Stokowski um, is speaking from anthropology. Do you want to say a word about her? Uh, yeah, so it actually follows up on these health concerns. Um, uh, Magda's going to talk about uh, site she, uh, researchers in Kazakhstan, that is a former Soviet nuclear site um, where people effectively consider themselves to be mutants, to be genetically modified, and they think it keeps them healthy. So, very <laughs> so we look forward to seeing many of you next week. Um, we have our discussion uh, section this Thursday. If you want to talk about which reading we're going to focus on, please come around me for just a couple minutes right now. Thanks very much. Thanks.